Good day. I am uh, Dr. Palata, a clinical microbiologist, and today we are going to discuss about a worldwide life-threatening condition called uh, malaria. Um, let me just uh, quickly share my screen with you. Um, so I was talking about this uh, life-threatening condition called malaria that we are going to, to discuss today. But starting, we are going to start with uh, some uh, key facts about malaria. And the first one is that uh, what I have said that uh, it is a life-threatening disease and it is caused by parasites that are transmitted to human host through the bite of uh, infected female anopheles mosquitoes. So, and in 2018, almost half of the world population was at the risk of developing this disease. And uh, most of the cases and uh, death associated with malaria can be found in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, it can also, the rest of the cases can be found in the WTO regions of the Southeast Asia uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, the Western Pacific, and the Americas. So, as I said, that almost half of the people in the world, so it was about 3.2 billion of people, that is almost the half world population, is at risk of developing malaria. And in 2018, we can see here in 2018 that 228 million of people became ill. Actually, they developed the disease. 228 million of people developed the disease in 2018. And uh, 405,000 people died from malaria in 2018. And this is costing um, uh, about 12 billion US dollars per year, you know, in economic losses, losses in Africa alone, it's costing about 12 billion dollars every single year. So it is indeed a major condition that we have to deal with. And, um, and the West affected group of people, uh, it's uh, what we, uh, it's, uh, of uh, children uh, aged under five years that are the most vulnerable group of affected by, by malaria. And uh, they accounted in 2018 for 67% of the total number of people that, uh, uh, that died from uh, malaria in, uh, in 2018. So children under the age of five years are the worst affected. Now, in terms of causative uh, pathogens, we have uh, five parasite species that cause malaria in humans. And uh, two of these species are the most prevalent. And it's mainly Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax that are able to cause most of the condition. Uh, they, cause the, they pose the greatest threat and in 2018 alone, Plasmodium falciparum accounted for almost 99.7% of estimated malaria cases in the uh, WHO African region. You know, in the African region, most of the cases, 99.7% of cases were caused by Plasmodium falciparum alone. And in the WHO Southeast Asia region, 50% of the cases were caused by Plasmodium falciparum. And in the Eastern Mediterranean region, 71% of cases were caused by falciparum, Plasmodium falciparum, and 65% in the Western Pacific. So Plasmodium vivax was the second leading cause of malaria in 2018. Well, it was the predominant parasite in the WHO region of the Americas, representing about 75% of all malaria cases. So you can see that those are the top two species of plasmodium that are associated with malaria. They are known to cause malaria. 
And uh, in some patients, we found mixed infection. So cases of malaria caused by mixed species of uh, plasmodium. We can found both falciparum and vivax uh, mainly. And um, the other sad news is that uh, malaria is uh, becoming now a zoonotic infection because we have now confirmed cases of uh, malaria in monkeys. In monkeys, they are caused by plasmodium neolacy. So those cases of malaria in monkeys uh, have been now reported to cause infection in humans, you know, in South, uh, Southeast Asia. Those cases are confirmed, but so far we don't have uh, a zoonotic malaria cases in Sub-Saharan Africa yet. But in Asia, we already have these cases. Now, specifically here in South Africa, malaria transmission areas in South Africa include a number of provinces like the northeastern part of KwaZulu-Natal and the low altitude areas in Pumalanga and Limpopo they are affected, especially um, provinces that are bordering uh, countries like Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Swaziland. So we have uh, many cases of malaria, you know, around the borders. Here we have Botswana, we have uh, Zimbabwe, we have Mozambique, we have Swaziland. So all those uh, South African provinces that are bordering those areas are at the high risk of uh, developing uh, malaria. And uh, we also have some uh, cases in the Northwest and the Northern Cape provinces, especially uh, areas that are adjacent to uh, the Molopo and the Orange Rivers, respectively. So uh, in those provinces, we also have uh, rare cases of uh, malaria. And um, in South Africa, malaria transmission is uh, found to occur mainly between uh, September um, uh, and May, so of the next year, so uh, where we found most of the cases. And there are also cases of malaria that can be found. They can be uh, where mosquitoes, uh, infected mosquitoes are maybe transported inside the taxis or suitcase or people staying around the airport. So we have seen some of those cases. And, um, and one of the provinces that receive also uh, many immigrants coming from uh, other, uh, coming from a tropical and subtropical region is the Gauteng province where it is also affected by cases of malaria. Now let's look at the life cycle how this happens when you become exposed. So everything starts with uh, the bite from an uh, infected mosquito and it's a female of anopheles. So when you have an infected female of anopheles that bites the human, it bites you through the skin and it introduces the parasite that we call the plasmodium. You know, and uh, the stage at which the plasmodium is introduced from uh, the mosquitoes to the human, it's uh, what we call sporozoid. So then the sporozoid will gain access immediately and very fast to the liver. So they come into the liver. And this cycle here, this phase in the liver, it's what we call exoerythrocytic cycle, where the infection will... Uh, then happen into the liver where the sporozoid will uh, infect the hepatocytes that are the liver cells become infected. And uh, so we have the hepatocytes that are infected, then the sporozoid will then mature to give uh, hepatic schizont. And when you have a rupture schizont, then it will disseminate in the bloodstream. But when you are infected with uh, the species of uh, uh, plasmodium vivax or plasmodium ovale, some of them will remain dormant in the liver inside the hepatocyte. They, they develop, they become what we call hypnozoid. So hypnozoid are dormant, uh, sporozoid, dormant uh, sporozoid inside the the liver cells, they remain there for several weeks up to a year. 
you know, so they are able to cause recurrent uh, malaria conditions. So someone, someone has traveled for a very long period of time and developed malaria. He is not, uh, he does not have a recent travel history from a malaria endemic area, but it's because of the hypnozoid that were the dormant stage of the parasite into the liver cells. So we say that the sporozoids, after infecting the liver cells, they mature to schizont, then a ruptured schizont uh, will then uh, gain access to the bloodstream, where we, we are now in a second uh, cycle that we call erythrocytic cycle, where now the parasite will start infecting the red blood cells. You know, they start infecting the red blood cells and when they infect the red blood cells, so here they, when they gain the bloodstream, the schizont become merozoid. So the merozoid will then infect the red blood cells. Then you have an erythrophozoid stage. They change from merozoid to trophozoid where you have a ring form uh, depending on uh, different species. Then from there, we have late trophozoid. So basically the merozoid will become the trophozoid. Then they will again become the schizont and this uh, erythrocytic cycle will continue. But there are some trophozoid uh, or merozoid here who will differentiate to gametocytes. They will differentiate to gametocytes and they are then ready to be taken by a mosquito during a next uh, blood meal occasion, then the mosquito will uh, then, uh, while taking the next blood uh, meal, it will then take the gametocyte and the gametocyte inside the mosquito stomach will then uh, go through different stages. Uh, they will mature to become sporozoid, then they will uh, gain the salivary gland of the mosquitoes. And when that mosquito will go to bite, another human host, it will then uh, uh, transmit the infection again. So the cycle that is happening inside the mosquito is called the sporogonic cycle. So this is uh, um, how the uh, malaria transmission takes place. Now, in terms of clinical presentation, so the incubation period depends on the species of plasmodium, but in general, it varies between seven to 35 days. And um, malaria begins with uh, non-specific symptoms. It will, they will look like flu-like symptoms. You have a headache, a pain, general fatigue, chills, and occasion occasionally you can uh, develop nausea. And then the patient will then develop the famous intermittent fever. So you will have that fever with uh, a pattern that we call uh, intermittent fever. So that febrile pattern that I will show you on a graph, um, actually the several days they will uh, remain for several days to a week after the onset of uh, parasitemia. And um, that the schizogonic cycle will synchronize. It means that uh, the infection that is caused by plasmodium vivax or valley of plasmodium, plas uh, uh, falciparum, will have a cycle that will be completed within uh, 48 hours. So it means that if you have a peak of uh, fever on uh, day one, and then uh, after 48 hours, it means that after two days, so on a third day, you will have another peak of uh, temperature. You will have another peak of temperature. But if you are infected with uh, plasmodium falciparum, the cycle is completed uh, 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 72 hours later. So it means that uh, the second peak of the temperature will uh, uh, take place only on day four. So if it happens every 48 hours, it's what we call a malaria tertiana. And if it happens every uh, 72 hours, it's called the malaria quartana. And um, there is also falciparum, although it also causes uh, malaria tertiana, but it causes uh, a malignant form of tertiana malaria that we call malaria tropica. And uh, here we can see 
Um, this is uh, when the infection is caused by plasmodium vivax or ovale. You can see that on day one, when they, after the incubation period, when you have the rise of the temperature, you reach the peak, maybe 39 degree. And uh, then after that, uh, it comes back. You have a remission, decrease in temperature uh, until you have a complete remission for the next 48 hours. Then you have another peak on day three. So, and this happens again, another peak. So it gives you what we call intermittent fever. But if you are infected by plasmodium malaria, then it is you have an initial peak on day one and the second peak will happen on day four. On day four, that is malaria quartan and this is malaria tertian. And here a specific subtype of tertiary malaria caused by plasmodium falciparum, where you will see a peak here. There is no uh, true decrease in the temperature. There is no actual remission, okay? So, and um, it, it does not follow the classic pattern of tertiary malaria. And uh, this is uh, the big problem that we have with uh, plasmodium falciparum. So it does not follow the classic uh, malarial paroxysm. So that happens when you have an initial rise in temperature for about 39.8 degrees. So what happens is that you have, again, a vasoconstriction, a peripheral vasoconstriction that will uh, 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 happen and uh, the patient will then uh, uh, feel chilled, uh, so there will be a period of chills, and uh, that will last about uh, 10 minutes to one hour, and the temperature will uh, slightly rise to 40 or 41 degree, and that febrile stage will remain there over two to six hours, then you will have then peripheral vasodilation, the patient starts sweating and the temperature starts decreasing, and depending on the species of the plasmodium, the cycle will repeat every 48 hours or every 72 hours. So these boots occur mainly in the afternoon and in the evening hours. So once the paroxysm has abated and the fever has fallen, the patient feels well again until the next one begins. So in severe malaria cases, like the case of malaria tropica, uh, there are a lot of disturbances. You can see that the temperature is not following the true pattern because uh, the patient develop uh, other conditions like delirium or you can have uh, circulatory uh, problems. The patient uh, um, um, might have uh, um, other mental uh, problems like decreased level of consciousness and so on. So during the course of infection, the malaria paroxysm are repeated at intervals until uh, the parasite multiplication in the erythrocyte is suppressed by chemotherapy, or maybe at least reduced by the host immune response. So the parasite that persists in the host can cause relapses. And uh, we spoke about uh, relapses that are recurrent cases. It's either from uh, persistence of uh, replication during erythrocytic forms that, uh, that can happen, or maybe we have reactivation of a hypnozoid. Remember, hypnozoid are the dormant form of the parasite inside the liver cells. They can reactivate and uh, cause uh, the infection. Now we have a severe clinical presentation of malaria, uh, clinical features of uh, severe malaria. It, uh, we make the diagnosis of uh, severe form of malaria when you have impaired level of consciousness, you have prostration, uh, the patient develop convulsions, so or there is uh, a respiratory distress with uh, acidosis, uh, pulmonary edema, uh, circulatory challenges leading to shock, you know, and um, anemia jaundice, all those complications of uh, hemolytic uh, anemia, 
serious hemolytic anemia because you remember that uh, the parasites in the bloodstream will infect and destroy the red blood cells leading to anemia with complications, you know. <clears throat> and uh, the high risk group of people who often develop uh, severe malaria cases can be pregnant and postpartum women, infants and children, uh, elders, you know, people who have their spleen removed and uh, immunocompromised patients. And some patients will develop a much more severe form of malaria that we call a cerebral malaria. And the cerebral malaria happens because of the situ adherence and the formation of rosettes. So the red blood cells infected with a maturing uh, plasmodium falciparum, it mainly plasmodium falciparum that is associated with uh, cerebral malaria. So the schizont adhere to the endothelium of the blood vessels and they can cause blockage of the vessels, especially if it's in the brain, then uh, uh, there, are, uh, there is a decreased level of consciousness and uh, conversions and all other associated uh, clinical manifestations that are associated with uh, cerebral malaria. So this happens because of the interaction between uh, the strain specific of uh, plasmodium falciparum with a specific host receptors that we call CD36 that is allowing this from happening. And from there, there will be a huge production of uh, cytokines, especially the pro-inflammatory cytokines, including the TNF alpha that will be released and uh, they will be responsible for the much more severe clinical presentation that the patient will have. So actually plasmodium falciparum use that situ adherence mechanism as a protective mechanism for it to escape uh, the treatment that is given. Now there are some people who can resist uh, uh, the effect of uh, the plasmodium or maybe they might not uh, uh, develop the condition at all because of uh, the natural resistance. And for instance, uh, the erythrocytic development of uh, plasmodium falciparum will not take place in a patient with uh, uh, some type of uh, hemoglobinopathy, you know, and uh, also in a patient who are suffering from, who have uh, another condition that we call uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. So the G6PDD and the beta thalassemia. So those patients will uh, see that their erythrocytic stage of malaria is not taking place. So they will not, they resist uh, from uh, developing the condition, and there are many other situations where you can resist uh, uh, the condition. And the laboratory diagnosis uh, of malaria is done mainly through malaria rapid diagnostic tests, and uh, those rapid diagnostic tests detect the specific antigens produced by malaria parasites in the blood. So those are antigen detection tests, and some RDT tests can detect only one species, and mainly the plasmodium falciparum. Remember that the plasmodium falciparum is the leading cause, especially in uh, the African and the Asian uh, WHO regions. Uh, other tests can detect multiple species, so whether the virus, malaria, or ovale, and uh, it's done through a finger prick. And so it is important to know what type of rapid test you are using, because if you suspect malaria, you do the RDT test that detects only one species. You might miss uh, other species if the malaria was caused by different species. And we can also do, beside the rapid test, we can do microscopy, and there are two test two different type of tests here. There is a, a, the thin blood smear and the thick blood smear. So this is uh, an example of a thin smear. You can see that the drop of blood is uh, spread over a large surface on a slide. And this is a thick uh, smear. And the, the difference is that uh, the thick smear will just help you to know uh, whether um, the parasite is present or not. Uh, but the thin smear will actually allow you 
to find out the species of plasmodium that is able to cause malaria. And uh, in patients who develop a severe form of malaria, it's better to do other tests, like uh, to check for sugar uh, levels, because they might develop hypoglycemia, to check if there is no uh, metabolic acidosis, to uh, find out if they, usually those patients will develop severe normocytic anemia. So you need uh, to look at that and uh, also other conditions like to do a chest x-ray to find out if there is no pulmonary edema. You can measure serum creatinine to see if there is no renal impairment. So those are additional tests that we have to do in patients who develop a severe form of malaria. So. In managing the patient, we need first to say if there is a, the malaria is uncomplicated form or it's a severe malaria. So uncomplicated malaria are the one with mild symptoms. The patient comes himself in an outpatient department. He has a normal mental function and no repeated vomiting, no jaundice, no other features that we, we, we explain associated with severe malaria. So in a case of uncomplicated malaria, we can uh, use coartem, that is artemeta uh, lumefantrin, so we can uh, give the patient coartem, or alternatively, we can give uh, oral quinines. Uh, we can associate that with uh, doxycycline or clindamycin. But in a severe form of malaria, then here we can start the patient with uh, uh, IV artesunant, or if not available, we can give uh, IV quinine. Um, and uh, and uh, once the patient is able to tolerate oral treatment, then we can, uh, uh, we can switch from coartem uh, tablet, so artemeta lumefantrin, or then we can give the patient quinine tablets. We can also associate that uh, with a doxycycline or clindamycin. Then in terms of uh, prevention of, uh, of this disease, we, we have uh, the ABCD of the ABC of malaria. It means that we need to raise awareness and assessment of the risk if the patient wants to travel at a region where the risk of malaria is high. We need to assess that. So avoidance of mosquito bites, either using uh, um, some uh, cream or product or, or mosquito repellent uh, uh, product to avoid mosquito bites. And uh, uh, you also can use a chemoprophylaxis uh, when indicated. When you feel sick, early detection of malaria and effective uh, treatment. So this is the ABCDE of uh, malaria prevention. So the recommended prophylactic regimen are uh, mainly mefloquine. So mefloquine, you can start at least one week before entering a malaria area. Take once weekly and uh, for four weeks after leaving the malaria area. You can also use, so you use mefloquine weekly or you can use doxycycline daily. You start one day before entering the malaria area, take it daily and four weeks after leaving the area. We also have atuvacuan proguanil that can also be used daily. Um, in this table, I want mainly to uh, underline the, con the, the, the contraindication of uh, uh, some of those medications. Uh, mefloquine is not indicated in patient with an uh, epileptic patient or patient who have a psychiatric uh, problem, including depression. Doxycycline is not uh, recommended, indicated in patient with pregnancy and in children under uh, uh, 80 years of age, and also in patient with myasthenia gravis. And uh, atovacuanil proguanil is also not indicated in patients who have uh, renal impairment and also pregnancy. The reason we don't use in pregnancy, we don't use in pregnancy, is just because we don't have uh, data to support that. So um, here we can see that uh, uh, women with pregnancy, the drug of choice will be just mefloquine because doxy is not indicated and uh, atovacuanil is not recommended due to the lack of data. Uh, 
And women in childbearing age, we can also use mefloquine. Breastfeeding women, we have insufficient data, but WHO suggests mefloquine. And young children, especially, we need to avoid taking them, young children under the age of five and pregnant women in the malaria area. So um, thank you for um, following this presentation. You can uh, uh, follow up with uh, questions if you have in our channel. You can post your questions and uh, we will come back to you with uh, answers. So thank you. Uh, check out our other lectures in our channel. Thank you.